Hello everyone, my name is Anton Pelcher. I'm an engineer and I've been building fish farms for over 10 years. In this video, we're going to talk about a RAS farm water supply. So watch this video to the end, because I will not only tell why you need water, but I will also talk about how much water you need. And I'll also give you a ready calculation of the water consumption of any fish farm for all the major fish species. So let's go! And let's start with how much water does a RAS farm need? I'm not talking about filling the tank once, and that's pretty obvious. I'm talking about how much your fish farm is going to consume on a daily basis. There are several aspects. Why does water loss in RAS happen in general? You probably know that RAS is not a completely closed environment. There are water losses. These losses are on average 10-15% per day of the total water volume of the tanks. So, this water is spent with two main purposes. The first one is for flushing filters. As drum filter is constantly washed, it's required to discharge residue. And the second one is for nitrates removal from the system. Because during biofilter operation nitrates are accumulated in a rat system, and when they exceed a certain maximum, they begin to negatively affect fish growth and development. If we are talking about water losses in the system, how high are those losses? How do you calculate it? How do you figure it out? There are more or less standard figures related to farming of 1 kg of fish. This is actually based on practice, taking into account the maximum concentration of nitrates, which can be maintained, and the volume of water, which is discharged daily. Daily, for example, from drum filter, as well as water that is discharged from the rest of the water treatment system. So, for sturgeon, in order to grow 1 kg of sturgeon, you need about 300 liters of water. Based on this figure, you can calculate water consumption of the farm of any capacity. For trout, which is slightly more sensitive to nitrates, about 400 liters of water are required for growing 1 kg of fish. And for African catfish, this figure is much smaller and an average is about 70 liters per 1 kg. Because the amount of nitrates in the system can easily reach 1000 mg per liter. This is the first, and the second, it requires a much smaller volume of water, less power and less space. Well, and let's translate these figures into more tangible. Let's take, for example, a sturgeon farm with capacity of 10 tons of grout fish per year. We know that it takes 300 liters of water to grow 1 kg of fish. Multiply 10,000 kg by 300 liters and you get 3,000 cubic meters of water. This is the amount of non-returnable losses that you will need to supply to the farm and discharge from the farm, divided by 365 days, and we get a little over 8 cubic meters per day. This is the average flow of your fish farm. That is, 8.5 cubic meters per day will be discharged from your ass, and you will need further to do something with the discharged water, and of course to supply fresh water to compensate for these losses. I certainly didn't mention such a thing as evaporation, probably just because it's pretty obvious, but it's not calculable and depends very much on what your room temperature will be. Because the lower the air temperature, the higher evaporation is. More evaporation means more water loss. The higher the temperature, the less these losses are. So now, conditionally, we consider evaporation as zero, subject to all the necessary air temperature standards. Well, let's move on to where to get water from, what the sources are, what are their pros and cons. And the first and the most obvious thing we're going to discuss is municipal water supply. What is the central water supply? I'm not even going to talk about it. Everyone knows it very well. You open the tap, water comes out of the central treatment facilities of your city or town, sometimes mostly from rivers if it's a large city, or an underground water source, for example a borehole if it's a small town. What are advantages and disadvantages of central water supply? Let's start with the pros. The first advantage is that if your plot, your building is connected to the central water pipeline, then you automatically get free connection of your farm. And probably the second advantage is that the water generally meets the standards. That is, you get portable water, which is ready for use at a fish farm. In principle, all the advantages are limited to these two. And let's also talk about disadvantages. First of all, you must pay for tap water. The average cost per cubic meter of tap water in my country is, on average, 50 cents for cold water supply. 
This means that if you need to spend 300 liters of water for growing sturgeon, then you will have to pay 15 cents per 1 kilogram of fish for the water supply. And we multiply this 15 cents by 10 tons, that is, we multiply by 10,000 kilograms, we get 1,500 US dollar a year that you will have to spend to provide your farm with clean, fresh water. Generally speaking, not such a great cost. But still, if there is another option which is free, why pay? And the second disadvantage is, of course, chlorine. I think that everyone who once visited a swimming pool remembers well what I'm speaking about. You come out of the pool with your eyes stinging, the skin is dry. If you know this feeling, press the like button and we go on. So, chlorine creates some trifle problems for humans, but as far as res is concerned, it can create very serious problems. Now, certainly, it will not kill or even damage the fish, because it's not contained in very high concentrations in the water. But chlorine is fatal for the biofilter. I had a story. We were launching a large farm. We started up the biofilter. Everything was working fine. And then the biofilter began to fall in productivity indicators. No one understood why. From day to day, biofilter worked worse and worse, and ammonia was growing. Then we began to understand what was the cause of the problem. It turned out that it so happened that this farm was set up in a region where there is no normal quality groundwater, and all the water supply came from the central water pipeline. So in August-September, due to the fact that water blooming started accelerating, water began to be chlorinated very actively, and the farm used water with residual chlorine. And this chlorine began to kill the microflora of the biofilter. And nobody had understood before what the cause was. When we installed additional anti-chlorine treatment, the problem was resolved, and the biofilter restored its operational parameters. And the third and the last disadvantage of central water supply that I wanted to admit is, of course, its instability. If your farm is located in a rural area, and farms are usually a more rural story than urban one, you can run into a problem of water outage, and if you don't have water reserve or a backup water source, then be prepared to have problems when the central water supply is cut. So be careful, plan for either some water reserve for a few days or a backup source accordingly. And the next type of water source is underground water. Underground waters can be attributed to three main categories. The first is surface water or underground water. Imagine a well, I think everyone has seen it somewhere in the countryside. An ordinary well at your grandma's country house, where groundwater is collected and you supply it to the farm. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not that good, because the well is a very unstable, unreliable source of water supply. The maximum you can use it for is to supply a very small farm, and even then, today there is water in the well. But tomorrow it might not be there, tomorrow you'll pump it out, and the flow rate just won't be enough. Of course, there are stable and good wells, but this is very rare. Also, the water is unstable in composition. It can contain all sorts of crap, such as some nitrates and toxic chemicals from the field. So, the water is unstable in quality, it's also unstable in temperature. Let's consider other two underground water sources, which are more optimal and potentially interesting for the supply of fish farms. These are wells of the second aquifer, so that it's already deep underground water, usually a depth of 30 to 60 meters. This well, which doesn't require license, which is easy enough to drill, and yet it can easily provide water to small and medium-sized fish farms. Well, in the extreme case, you will need two or three such wells. Generally, they are very well suited. Water is stable in composition, stable in temperature. Thus, generally, it's a good option. Surely, you can encounter a situation when water from the second aquifer is not enough, and you need to look for deeper groundwater. Or, for example, the composition of water from the second aquifer is not the same, for instance, contains a lot of pollutants. And then you drill a deeper well, 70 meters or more, to get artesian water. Artesian water is usually even better in debit. The flow and it's often better in quality. Although this is not a matter of fact, there are different kinds of water. But the nuance of an artesian well lies in the fact that you need to license it. Be prepared that you will need to provide for a sanitary zone radius of around 30 meters. That means you won't be able to build anything within that radius. So it will be completely unused territory, and you will need a license as well. So think in advance. If you have the option to use the second aquifer, it's much easier in several aspects.
Let's analyze the general borehole advantages. The advantages are of course stability. You have all year round water supply with the same temperature. Composition is also almost always the same. Well, and the second advantage, it's free. These two advantages combined most likely make wells the most interesting source of water supply for fish farms. Probably most of the farms supply water from boreholes. And what are the disadvantages of the borehole? It has to be drilled. If it's an artisan well, you have to license it. And the third point is the surprise that you can get when you drill it. You get the water and it's just of bad quality. And then if you can't treat it economically, you will have to look for another source of water supply or try to drill a well in some other location, not aquifer. And the third source of water supply is surface water which in principle is also absolutely standard for the supply of fish farms. What is surface water? It's when you take water from a pond, lake, river and any other open water source. Let's break down the pros and cons of this option. Let's start with the pros. Surface water's rule is not limited in quantity. Thus, you can pump as much as you want as you have a whole river. Take as much water as you need. And by the way, a lot of direct flow fish farms, mostly state-owned, that incubate fertilized eggs and then grow fry, lay eggs once a year and use a natural direct flow from an open water source. As there is a lot of water, it's normal in terms of temperature. And thus, such farms get gradual hatching and then growing of fry. Speaking of rice farms, I would suggest considering open water sources only if there is no acceptable underground ones. Why? Because of the disadvantages of this approach. First, if you do it officially, your project will definitely require an expertise. You can't just pump water from a surface water source for industrial purposes. Regulatory authorities will definitely come up to you one day. Therefore, the expertise, the permission are necessary. Only then you can use such water. The second point, you will need to provide water intake. And it's not always cheap. If you need to, for example, use the pipe of 100 meters, do wells, underflow water intake and so on. It's not always a cheap story, an economy option. The next point is instability. First, water can be contaminated. Well, what is a surface water source? It presumes contamination, which is brought in by birds. Fish that live there contains many parasites. Water contains all sort of nastiness and harmful substances. That's what surface water source such as a river, lake or a pond presumes. The next issue, it's unstable in composition. For example, it may bloom in August-September, which means a pile of green can incidentally get to your water intake. So, be aware of the following. Water temperature in winter is 0 or 1 degrees in my region. In summer, the temperature rises up to 25, if not up to 30 degrees of Celsius. And it's important to understand how you will deal with this temperature throughout the year. So that you won't get hypothermia in winter and overheat in summer, so be careful. A surface water intake is also a normal source of water supply. But as long as there are no acceptable underground water supply options. And where do you get the water from? Maybe there are some other alternatives. Write it in the comments. Maybe there are some tips that I have not mentioned and didn't specify. Be sure to write about it and we'll discuss it together. The next important point is the requirements to water parameters. Certainly, for the purpose of fish farming, you cannot use any water. You need it to meet the basic required parameters. There are special industrial standards for fish farming, which reflect all the basic parameters, not only in closed systems, but also in open systems. The general standards for fish farms water supply can be easily browsed and found on the Internet. By and large, the requirements to water for fish farms are very close to those for humans for drinking water supply. That's why, as a rule, the city central water supply, with the exception of chlorine issue, is ideal for water supply of the fish farm. But how to understand whether the water you have is of good quality or not? What are its parameters and what to do to measure these parameters? I don't recommend that you do the tests by yourself if you are not a certified laboratory. Because aquarium tests, which are likely to be at your fingertips, are very inaccurate. They don't reflect all the necessary parameters. So, I recommend to collect around a liter of water, a simple bottle, and take it to a specialized laboratory. 
pay a couple hundreds of dollars and you will get a complete and high quality water analysis, which will give you a clear idea of whether it's suitable or not. If it doesn't suit, then you can already draw conclusions what to do about it. Well, it's a logical question. What to do if the water doesn't comply with the parameters? Firstly, you need to figure out exactly what parameters are not suitable. There are two standard options. The first is central water supply, but definitely chlorine will be present in this water. Most likely, chlorine can be removed by either a large tank with aeration, which blows off chlorine into the atmosphere, or by installing charcoal filters. Either option is fine. The second, surface water sources. In this case, there are standard solutions too. It's necessary to provide mechanical water treatment. Drum filter is ideal for such tanks. The second solution is degassing. If you take water from the depth, you will definitely need a degasser. If from the surface, in general it's not necessary. The next solution is disinfection either with ozone or ultraviolet, but usually ultraviolet is used due to simplicity. And the last is of course water heating. Generally, it's needed for water supplied from any borehole, any central water supply line. It's just evident that this equipment is needed. And if we talk about water treatment, it's mechanical treatment, disinfection, and sometimes degassing that are presumed. This is the main equipment that is required to treat water from a surface water source. Well, and the third option, which is not so unambiguous, it's underground water. Why? Because these waters may contain a wide range of contaminants for example, because in some regions water is highly saturated with iron, and you will need to put aeration columns to treat water from iron. The next option. Sometimes the water is hard, you need to put water softeners. Sometimes the water contains sludge or already oxidized iron. Then you need to provide mechanical treatment. Sometimes it contains manganese, hydrogen sulfide, and a whole range of substances. In the worst case, you need a reverse osmosis unit. What is it? In fact, there is a membrane, which infiltrates only water molecules, and all other impurities are detained by this device. In the output you get almost distilled water, which doesn't contain any harmful substances. That's why the water after reverse osmosis must also be diluted with regular water. But in general, such systems are very expensive both in installation and operation, so we recommend avoiding this option. Only if there are no other options, the water is of really poor quality and there are no alternatives. In other cases, you can either not treat water at all if it fits the parameters, and you will do a laboratory analysis if you need it or install more or less simple and inexpensive water treatment filters. And now let me mention the bonus I promised you. Following the link in the description, you can download a detailed calculation of the water amount required for any fish farm, any size and any fish. You just type in the farm capacity and see how much water this farmer is going to consume. Well, in this video, I hunted down the issue of major water sources. We've talked about where you can get water from a fish farm, why you need it at all, how to treat it, prepare it before supplying terrace, feed it to the farm, and how much makeup water is required. It's Sanson Pelcher and my channel on how to grow fish and make good money.